I'm Natasha Hersham, co-creator of The Vov, and welcome to this lunchtime tour with Saraband. Today we'll be exploring The Vov's virtual presentation of Corpus Mentis, a new group show of seven female artists co-curated by Hikari Yokoyama and Trino Bacardi. The artists featured in Corpus Mentis each have very different practices, but all use the human body as a starting point for their creations, delving deep into the multidimensional and complex nature of corporal existence. With digital avatars sitting alongside porcelain ceramics and extraterrestrial skyscapes shining above oil paintings, it's so exciting to see this melting pot of artists, processes and mediums come together for the first time in one virtual space, which we'll hear all about very shortly. But just before we begin, a little housekeeping. If this is your first time joining an event on the VOV, then a special warm welcome to you. There's a live transcription available for this event. If you'd like to make use of this service, please click the live transcript setting at the bottom of your screens to enable this. A recording of the event will further be uploaded onto the on-demand section of our website for you to enjoy in your own time at thevov.art. As ever, there'll be time for questions at the end, so please do pop these in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens throughout the talk. And we'd particularly love to hear from you if you haven't asked a question before, so don't be shy. Now, it's with great pleasure that I can introduce you to our wonderful speaker today. Born in Tokyo and brought up in Chicago, Hikari studied at Columbia University. Working for gallerist and dealer Jeffrey Dyche, she became immersed in the art world doing art advisory, independent curatorial projects and commissioning artists. Starting the art news blog, Art Observed, and later with a plan to revolutionize the art world through the internet, Paddle 8 was successfully launched. Moving to London with her now fiance, Jay Jopling, Hikari began consulting for Audi, Prada, Miu Miu, Bombay Sapphire, Gucci, Tiffany & Co, Spring Studios, Caprice Holdings and others. Currently a contributing editor at British Vogue, Hikari uses her background in art and the digital sphere to create audiences through cultural experiences and is passionate about social entrepreneurship, particularly in empowering women. We couldn't be more excited to have you here with us today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Hikari to explore all things Corpus Mentis. Thank you, Natasha. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and to share um, this exciting exhibition that I've been working on with Saraband Foundation since, uh, I guess, since earlier this year. Um, it's been a long journey and it's been a new experience. Um, because of COVID and lockdown, we have developed this entire exhibition from nothing and through uh, all digital exchange. So all the studio visits I did were on Zoom, all the works that I viewed have been through digital files um, and we created the space from scratch, obviously collaborating with Evolve on their um, architecture, but it's been such a different experience to actually create a uh, digital exhibition through digital means. Um, it's exciting though to work also with Saraband Foundation because I think Unlike a lot of the other institutions that are part of um, the Vov launch, which are more like traditional museums and galleries that do exhibitions as their the main bulk of what they do, um, Saraband Foundation is a really unique um, support system for creatives who don't really fit into the usual boxes. So while you'll see painters and sculptors and things like that in this exhibition and fine artists, you'll also see creatives who are working more in fashion design or jewelry or other forms of design. And a lot of them are working at the intersection of these various practices, which I think also makes it quite an interesting um, exhibition to curate and also to look at. Um, and there are seven artists in the show. They're all female artists um, and they're all very, very different. So without further ado, I'm going to start going into some of the specific works that we have in this show. And the first work that I really want to put focus on is by Sian Fan. Um, she's currently a resident at Saraband Foundation, and she has done this work called Microcosm, which is 
the work that you see actually coming through uh, the doorway and the windows and the skylights and the ceiling of the space. Um, if you're when you're when you're online and navigating through uh, the space and you're not it's not through Zoom, you'll see it much more. But it's actually a computer generated texture, um, which is created by how she programs um, all of these all of this different imagery from the natural world. And her impetus for this piece was to actually create a physical land or to create, sorry, to create a landscape for us that's also digital since we are in the digital space uh, rather than trying to replicate a landscape, a physical landscape. So it's kind of, it's quite an interesting work because it actually, um, it's a shame we can't actually go into it, like out the doorway and into it, but it goes on and on into infinite space. And that's something that's also I think quite interesting about working digitally is like, how do we create the boundaries between what we know, because we know the physical world that has a floor and a ceiling and a certain type of gravity and, and a certain way that light falls, um, or digital space where the physical laws are, are very different. Um, and so maybe you could just uh, turn a little bit. And when we, we adapted this the architecture so that we could actually see this piece <clears throat> throughout the exhibition. Um, and I think that work really kind of ties everything together because this, this show really is a lot about um, the physical body, um, but we can't get it, yeah, there we go. So you can kind of see how it's um, self-generative and it's existing outside of the space peeking through. Um, cool. So we, we, great. Yeah, you'll see it throughout as we go along. It's so beautiful. And actually, yeah, you should really look at it on the vault because on Zoom, the, the resolution is not as great as it should be. But, um, okay, so our next work is by Camilla Haney. Um, she is uh, primarily a sculptor um, and her work is incredibly, different in the sense that it's incredibly tactile and she makes most of her work um, herself by hand. These three sculptures are made from porcelain and all of her work has a great, um, a strong sense of materiality and particularly as that relates to craft. So she's often working with materials that are connected implicitly with domestic or feminine crafts such as porcelain or textiles or hair or pearls. Um, but this little triptych is um, meant to reference these kind of um, Virgin Mary figures. She, she's uh, Irish and grew up in Ireland, which is a very Catholic place. And so she grew up with all of these little figurines everywhere that kind of were meant to remind her about her own sense of morality, specifically as it applied to being a woman. Um, and that gendered morality often involves a uh, kind of repression. So repression of sexuality, of desire, of things like that. Um, it's interesting that she combined, so you, in the front we have the figure of the Virgin Mary, but then on either side we have other, uh, I would say kind of like symbolic archetypes. So on the right we have the ram's head, which in Egyptian mythology symbolizes fertility. And then on the left, we have the snake, the kind of tentacles, which uh, to me remind me of like kind of a Medusa, which is in Greek mythology um, of the kind of scary temptress woman. And she's just, uh, you know, alluding to, to those kind of um, ideas about femininity. And her goal, I would say, is to kind of disrupt them and to, to question them as well. Um, so moving on to the next work. Um, so this is actually two works. Um, again, very different practice. So maybe we could zoom in to see the video a little bit better. So I'll just, yeah, that can just continue playing. Um, but the, the, the wallpaper that's actually on the wall is a photograph of this, these, both of these works are by Roberts Wood, um, who are fashion, it's a fashion design label. And it's incredibly interesting how she approaches uh, making clothes for the body because 
her practice, as you can see by the background uh, texture, is really connected to, it's all hand knit and it's all very, um, sorry, maybe you can pause the video for a second and just focus on that work. But I think her, 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 um, her way of working, all of her, her garments kind of connect to this idea of hand knitting, which is a unique approach to textile design. So essentially, usually when you think of textile design, it's like a, it's like a kind of surface decoration that then goes on top of a structure. So you might have the structure of tailoring that's then embellished with beading, or you might have a corset that, that then is embellished with lace. Um, for Robert's Wood, the, the texture and the embellishment and the kind of beautiful detail is at once also uh, totally implicit to the structure. So as she hand knits these various different types of fabrics together, it could be um, silk chiffon or it could be uh, like more like a latex, they, they behave differently and some are much more rigid, some are much softer. Um, I love this image because it's so abstract, it almost looks like sea creatures or something. It's hard to, to place what it is, um, but it's actually just a, a texture of a, of a textile investigation. Um, and then if we go in, sorry to the video, <laughs> I'm so bad at thinking about two things at once, but this video is also very interesting because um, this is actually a kind of edited version of her doing a textile print development. And I thought it was really relevant too to this exhibition because she's referencing lots of different things like such as uh, Still Life of Flowers in, in Van Lee Vase by Ambrosius Bochart the Elder but she's also using uh, medical, hand-drawn medical illustrations. And she actually used to be a um, medical student. So it's that kind of surgical forensic, uh, I mean, it's such a cool animation, I feel like incredibly interesting to see, to actually see like the process about how she does, develops her, um, her, her digital prints. Um, where she's combining photography and, and, and these drawings and, and found imagery as well. Um, so that's very interesting and definitely worth having a closer look at. Um, and then we can go over to Paloma Tendero. So she is the final, um, she's, primarily a photographer, I would say, although her photographs exist as documents of these ephemeral performances, which are actually also sculptures. Um, she's very interested in the idea of the body and how it's not predictable, how it's decomposing, how it's, there are so many systems that we don't understand. Um, this, piece is called Sayula Madre. Um, she also has, um, these works are actually quite personal as well because um, her mother, uh, part of her practice developed when her mother was going through um, a really difficult terminal disease, kidney disease. And it's a disease that she realized that she would inherit. And, um, and she, she mentioned a quote to me by Susan Sontag when we were talking, which is she said that every human being is born with a double nationality, a passport of health or illness. And I think there's some aspect too of this mystery of like how, how a body can seem healthy, but it's not. What, are, what, are, what processes are going on under the surface? And in all of her work, she's bringing these, um, there's an aspect of seriality. So like from the first image, to the second to the third, you're seeing like a process unfolding. And um, her, the way she uses materials on the body, whether that's like plaster or in this one, it's kind of like a crochet woven threads. It's um, highlighting this like fragility and um, the fact that it's not static and that it's kind of disintegrating or falling apart or it's on the verge of that. Um, and she's, she also talks a lot about how we assume that uh, the natural state of humans is health, but is that actually true? Is there a natural state of what we should be? And, and maybe sometimes we're always ill and we're always healthy um, in different ways. So I think these works are incredibly beautiful. 
And if you keep going to her next work, which is called Veins, um, we see another incarnation of this kind of thought process through a different way. And these are, these are, she uses her own body. So again, very personal works. Um, and again, we see kind of the, the process of the, of the material changing over time by, you know, she uses the, this kind of seriality of images to show. Um, and it's, you know, it's obviously referencing the system that's internal to us of our blood pumping through our system, but, you know, none of us actually really get to visualize that or to, to truly really understand it, even though it's so in, integral to, to our lives and how we, how we feel. And maybe we don't pay attention to it until it's not working or until, you know, someone is sick. Um, but I love the fragility of her work and um, that she performs the works as well, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then the next one, the next work I want to talk about is Opposite Paloma, which wait before you press the film, but if you can go up to the sculptural part, these are actually um, two prosthetics. So this is Christina Walsh and she's quite interesting. She's definitely someone who's like cross boundaries in terms of her practice um, where she started, I think in shoe design. And then got really interested in prosthetics because it's something that's highly technical, highly uh, functional, but obviously very niche and an area of design that's not very aesthetic. Um, and that, you know, she, there's something also interesting about how she looks as pros at prosthetics, whereas like the object is kind of highlighting the absence of, of the limb, but the, support system is not actually the, um, the prosthetics itself. It's the whole like hu interhuman relationship that comes through um, people treating and looking after people who, who might have lost a limb or an amputee. Um, she makes, I mean, these works are again, difficult to see in zoom, but they're such, they're so, they're so highly refined. The surface is so um, polished and perfect. And she brought these, of course, again, same with fashion, I would say it's difficult to show works that are intended to be displayed through the body and movement and a personality and someone wearing them. But she brought some of her work to life through um, created, creating this film, which we can watch, which also involves um, a lot of pieces from Robert's Wood as well. So maybe we can play that film. And it's a shame there's no sound in the film, but there's some really beautiful sound design on this and music as well, which we couldn't include, unfortunately. But I love this film. Also, May uh, Sass, who helped kind of produce and put together this whole exhibition, she also was really involved with making this film. I mean, so while the film content itself is incredibly beautiful, mesmerizing, it's a great uh, document of, or result of kind of the collaborative way that Sarah Band Foundation, the different people working there, collaborate together and make things together. Um, which wouldn't maybe happen if they weren't all working from the same space in the same way. And here, so some of uh, Christina's works are actually the, like almost like jewelry, prosthetics is another thing like I mentioned, but she, um, there's an aspect of performing the objects, so they're designed 
for someone to like hold it in their hand and then someone else's hand to fit into the same object. So she's interested a lot in this um, communication between two bodies and touching. Um, there's one sculpture that we didn't get to include, but it's a really beautiful um, form that looks like a human heart and it's made out of resin. And it's also in a way that your hand can fit inside of it. And it's like, you get this physical sense of holding the human heart. And I'm hoping we'll get to the point where you can actually see these, the sculptures that are on the plinth in the video. Yeah, I mean, this is a great example of Robert's Wood work as well. So do you see what I was saying about how the, these kind of hand knit textures then become how they behave when they're woven together then dictates how the sleeve or the volume of the skirt will behave in the body. Um, which is kind of interesting because it's a real push pull between the materials and kind of her vision of what she wants to create she can she's allowing the material to kind of express what it wants to do and there's no kind of under underlying structure the structure is about how this texture kind of falls and hangs and is draped and connects so it's great to see those garments in action And here, I think we're getting to the point. So yeah, here we see someone performing the prosthetics. So. They're on this dancer's legs and it obviously creates this beautiful a different kind of form and, and it almost becomes surrealist like the legs become expressive in a very different way by putting these kind of hands or claws on the end of them but all of these um works are also like incredibly functional like someone could actually put these on and wear them and she has a whole process of you know, making molds, uh, casting, then, then carving it down, um, then redoing it again. She works with 3D printing. Um, it's a very, I posted a picture of her studio in on my Instagram, but it's, there's many, many, many um, parts to her process to get to the final object. Okay, so maybe we can go now to the next work. If you guys want to watch, I really suggest you guys see the rest of the film. Um, so this is quite, okay, so this room was quite a long story because the, this is an Ouroboros room. These, this is a duo um, who do couture fashion design, but their works, only exist well these works only exist in the digital space so while they also do couture garments and, and accessories that do you know exist physically we were really interested in showcasing their their digital work so their work is made and sold um for people who have avatars and who exist in the virtual world and all of their um garments um this is from a collection called biomimicry so this collection is really looking at uh, textures and movement and forms from the natural world. So again, we see this like kind of really articulated connection to flora and fauna and under the sea. I wish the resolution was better. Sorry guys, looking on Zoom, definitely look at these 
up close when you when you can um, on the Valve website. And we had a difficult time with this room because what one of the things that was interesting about working with uh, creatives who are working completely in the digital space is that we thought for a digital exhibition, we could really showcase it in a three-dimensional way. And we had planned to do a figure wearing this dress in the middle and it would be a kind of alternate digital landscape um, with a different sense of scale and like tree roots coming out and this, uh, a mat, you know, a human figure with this like, you know, wafting garment on it. And it actually ended up being very uh, complicated because even though, you know, in digital, in the digital realm, the, the possibilities are infinite, but you're also quite limited by, you know, the amount of time you have to code things, how long things take to load. Um, how to get different textures to read that maybe exist in one format to a different format. So it was quite challenging to, to translate that. So we ended up going back to just a more simple presentation of their um, design. So if you maybe turn to the right, you can see this puffer jacket. Um, and all of their designs uh, can be bought. And then they basically are program to fit perfectly onto your avatar. So again, I'm not like a digital programmer, so I don't know exactly how that this works, but it's um, it's amazing because they, they don't exist two dimensionally. They, like if you were to purchase this garment and look at it and put it on your body in the digital space or your avatar's body, it would work and move like a real garment. You would bend, be, you know, bend your arm, you can walk around it, you can zoom in, you can see the different textures of the of the virtual fabrics. And then um, within all of these garments are these um, beautiful kind of decorative statements of, you know, like in this one, we see like these kind of blue veins coming through the actual volume of the piece. Um, and other pieces like they have a headdress where the flowers are actually kind of growing off the headdress. And it's quite, it's, it's a really, it was really interesting for me because I had no idea really about um, this whole different marketplace for fashion that exists for people that are dressing themselves in, in, the, in the parallel universe of the digital realm. Um, they also were really keen to emphasize to me that this, all of this fashion is completely sustainable because there's no waste because there's no, nothing um, physically being produced. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, cool. So, can keep going onwards. Um, and then we have, okay, so these are two really beautiful documents of some Roberts Woods um, pieces. And they are, the image is called um, Self Portrait in Five Tableau. And it's with, I'm gonna mispronounce the name probably, but Nu Xuan Hua and Annie Lai. And there was a performance, uh, which was a collaboration between Roberts Wood and Nu Xuan Hua, who's in the photographs, as part of her Viscera Autumn Winter 2019 presentation. And uh, Roberts Wood was really exploring the way that what you wear changes the way that you feel. Um, so she started by talking, having conversations with lots of different female creatives, which then um, made her think about the importance of clothing pieces and how that influences how people feel about themselves and their own bodies. And then for the presentation or, you know, the moment where you kind of sh showcase your, your collection, she actually decided to work with a uh, new Shuan to do a performance. And um, she designed these hand link ruffled dresses in a way that they could be detached and put back together. Um, so, the performance was like showing the kind of construction of the garment and then how it could be fragmented and then reinterpreted. And the dresses were kind of worn and then taken apart, decomposed, reassembled, displayed in different ways that also indicated some the different aspects of, um, of Nushuan's personality. And um, again, I think, you know, with fashion, we think about the, the garment itself and what that looks like but there's a huge amount of thought and development that goes into how these garments are presented to the public and how um, they are brought into the world 
Um, and I think that it's quite, um, Robert's Wood has done an amazing job, not only creating, creating these, this really unique um, craft process that's also highly, highly technical, but also um, thinking about the way in which these, these garments come to life into, into the wider world. And again, that's very, something that I think is very, that Sarah Ben Foundation really encourages um, and I didn't get to see the performance, but I would have loved to be there. Um, and you can see on the left hand image, the white sleeve is, it's the reason I chose this image is because it's a very simple embodiment of the kind of basis of what Roberts Wood does, which is you can see almost like, I would call it like almost like the spine of the, of the hand knit um, texture where, that these layers of tool have kind of been knotted or woven together. And then you see the kind of decorative element, which is like, you know, the, 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 the transparent fabric billowing out, but that billow also creates a structure of like kind of the form of like how um, bouncy the garment will be or how much space, how thick, how wide the sleeve will be on the arm. Um, but it's so, it's such a different approach to fashion. I think it's, really, really um, beautiful and really incredible how, you know, developing this texture and this textile is one thing, but then getting it to hang on the body and to drape on the body and to, to be worn in a way that, it, you know, you, can, you could actually wear it out to a party is also really an incredible feat. And then in the other image you see, um, the one on the right, you see it's more like a kind of vinyl late I think it's like a vinyl fabric and it behaves very differently if you can scan to the right the image on the right Oop, yeah oh okay or we can go we can keep going to the next one okay <laughs> all right so now we are going to the next two works so here again we have two works we have um on the wall, we have Camilla Haney, which is called Lappet. And then um, next to on the plinth is a work by Christina Walsh. Um, Lappet is actually a three, this is actually a photograph of a three-dimensional work, a three-dimensional wall work that then we kind of feathered into the wall. So it looks like there's actually a sculptural object hanging there, but the object itself was so delicate. There's no way we could 3D scan it. And again, because we're working digitally, we could play with the scale a bit. So it's not maybe exactly true to scale of the real object. Um, but she, I really loved the, in light of the show and what's, what's happening in all these other works, the delicacy and the fragility of this sculpture. That's obviously a, a skeleton. And it's, um, you know, the idea of the skeleton is, again, I think tied with ideas of like kind of, you know, we think of mummies, we think of uh, kind of like, um, like a preservation of bones would be something, something very important or someone very important. Um, and she's interested in triggering people's curiosity and discomfort. So um, again, it's difficult to see in the Zoom, but the texture of this work is really, really important. Um, because it does feel like it's actually decomposing and it does feel like it's been unearthed from somewhere, um, but it's made out of um, materials. Uh, so then her, Christina Walsh's, I put this with Christina Walsh's prosthetic because I thought this was like a very, uh, this, this work contrasted a lot with the, with the wall work where this is a different idea of preservation of the body, which is implied through a prosthetic, which would be, you know, exists from the knee down if someone was amputated, but it's, again, it's stepping in for like what a real leg or foot could do or, or how it could perform, but it's become its own entity and it's incredibly beautiful. I don't know if we can move around it the way that she's sculpted and, and created this form that is, you know, it's not trying to mimic exactly how a, a real leg or a knee or an ankle would, would look, but taking on its own 
um, beingness through this, these materials of fiberglass and this kind of high performance materials and plastics that she works with. Um, but yeah, she's, it, I thought it was quite interesting too that, you know, it's such a specific area to get interested in. And maybe that's also why I was attracted to these works because I don't know anyone else really interested in working in prosthetics and really thinking about it um, in a deeper way. And then now we could go to Shannon Bono's work, which are paintings. So there's, we've got two paintings. Um, uh, so this one is called Untitled Mangbetu. So Shannon Bono is, um, she has Congolese roots and she's also from Sierra Leone, but she is, there's always uh, black bodies in her work often um, nude figures. Sometimes she paints friends of hers or family members, but it's often herself as well. It can also be self-portraits. And she used to be, interestingly, same as Roberts Wood, she was also a medical student and studied biology, I believe. And um, we see in this painting, there's a, a portrait of herself and then there's like a kind of silhouette of a um, Mengbetu chief's wife. and interestingly like these kind of Congolese sculptures and masks that we see a lot in contemporary art world they often you know you can see them at Freeze Masters or they were collected a lot by um, different people like the de Menils or Axel Root etc. Um, they're interesting because in the Congolese tradition they they often portrayed females which is not true of every kind of sculpture of, of, of this kind of period or tribal sculptures. And there was a big, um, there was a big honoring of like the female power of fertility and um, regeneration and life. And, um, and she also then references in the, in the background of her paintings, there's these kind of um, cellular motifs which are also related to um, African fabrics where they use like a, a wax boutique um, technique to create fabrics, but she's kind of reinterpreted them using cells. And again, it's, you know, I think it's, I think great painting is open to interpretation. So I don't want to be too didactic about it, but I saw it as really interesting about this kind of um, for me personally, like her looking back to history with this backdrop of, of kind of science or biology and kind of the implications of all of those things connecting. And I mean, we know that a lot of um, discussion, a lot of the way that uh, colonialism was justified was through scientific investigations where science said things um, or science got distorted to say things like survival of the fittest, uh, could be applied to races, um, so that so that meant that you know certain races were valued more than others, or that um, you know that certain types of people were were less than human. Um, so I think it's it's quite um, these works have a lot of a lot of weight to me, and they're they're really beautifully executed. Um, again, on Zoom, it's really hard to see the texture of of how she paints. Uh, but you get a bit, I really suggest looking at them on the wall as well. And then there's another um, painting that's opposite this one, which is a reference to, it's called Anxiety One. And she's referencing Frida Kahlo's famous painting, The Broken Column, which uh, is really well known and well renowned for expressing Frida Kahlo's pain and but also her resilience. And she in this painting is creating a visual representation of her difficult times at university. Um, in Kahlo's painting, she had nails all over her body to kind of show her suffering. But in this painting, Shannon used the double mask nail fetish sculpture um, in which nails and other materials are driven into the artifact to evoke the spirit to perform its role. Um, so, and you can see that her body is mutilated. Um, these beads are something that 
in her culture that women would wear um, traditionally around their waist. And again, we have like um, this relationship between her own body, this kind of mythical mask, um, okay, you can see the nails, mythical mask like representation of the body. And then we have the backdrop of the pattern, um, which I think those are kind of the key components of most, a lot of her paintings, which, um, which is really nice, this, this, uh, this flat backdrop then with the kind of more three-dimensional painted elements coming forward. And I think it's also really interesting too, because to me, they're kind of surrealists, um, but surrealism traditionally was a very white male dominated um, kind of movement in art history. And it usually used the female body as like a kind of object to, to communicate things about, you know, the subconscious, like whether that was desire or fertility or innocence or purity. And I think in these works, she's really taking the body back and, and positioning it more as subject. Um, but she's still like riffing on the language of, of surrealist painting where, um, you know, we have parts of bodies, we have objects and bodies presented on the same kind of picture plane and in the same space and with the same weight of rendering them. Um, but she's telling a story through using the body to tell her story. And the, it's not purely symbolic. It's, it's, it's very subject. It's very much about an experience of her own experience of having a black body and her experience of um, these uh, kind of embodying or, or being a new incarnation of these older kind of traditional um, cultural uh, ways of, of looking at things. Um, so I really, really love her paintings. Um, and then we have another work here. So this is the last work in the exhibition, which is another work by Sian Fan. And um, you can press play. So the, I would say, it's hard to say, again, she's, she works a lot in the digital space, but the original work that got me really excited was actually, um, it was more of a performance piece. So there was a screen on the wall and then she was lying on the floor, um, kind of moving around and writhing around with all these like very points and sensors on her body uh, on this kind of special suit. And her, which you can see on the right hand side now, that's actually her coming into the performance. And so in the original installation, it was almost like a mirror between the wall and the floor with her moving and writhing around on the floor. And then her movements would trigger this avatar that's existing on the screen. So it's kind of, to me, it was like a little bit like the narcissist looking into the mirror. But um, the interesting thing too was like the communication between this avatar and then her physical movement, movements in the suits and the glitches that came between these two, um, these two images, the image of her body performing and the image of this digital avatar. So the avatar has not come on yet. Um, but she often, Sian Fan, she's, she often works with dance and performance. So another work of hers that was really interesting to me was a performance that she did at Tate and again, she had two um, performers, two dancers, and they had these like kind of suits on with QR codes and cameras. And as the dancers moved around each other, um, the, the cameras would connect with the QR codes and they would trigger um, and generate these, these kind of celestial bodies, these like digital images that then would like float around, um, around the video of the performance. So her work is a lot about this like, the kind of glitch between real real world real body and like a digital bodily experience or a digital physical experience um and she's very creative and kind of like thinking more about how these two this kind of um boundary between digital and real world interacts with with one another um and how one informs the other. Another, um, another piece she did that was interesting to me was like a kind of, which we thought about including, was a huge landscape of a, a totally fictional landscape. 
But the idea was that, you know, people are so addicted to their screens and want to spend so much time on their screens. But what if you had a digital space where instead of your screen providing like more information and stimulus, it was actually just creating like a kind of meditative space where you don't really do anything and there's nothing to do and there's nothing really to take in. So it's almost like when you want, went through it, you were, oh, there's the avatar that's just popped up. Um, but when you were going through the space, it was almost like a kind of digital meditation, which is again, interesting commentary on like our addiction to screens and how we always need feel the need to be on a screen um, and how this has an effect on our own psychology or our, our own bodies. And she's obviously also really talented in terms of this whole other skill set, which I'm really not talented or know very little about, which is, you know, programming and, and how the code actually is the process that then connects and communicates the, the experience of, of the object. Um, so yeah, so this piece carries on, but you can see how, you can see how our avatar, there's like, it's not perfectly communicating with the movements of the body. It's slightly delayed. There's aspects that come into focus, come out of focus. Um, yeah, so so yeah, so that's pretty much the whole exhibition. I really encourage you to go back and look at, I haven't actually done an exhibition tour on Zoom. And I have to say, it does look very different on Zoom than if you actually go onto the Vob. So I really encourage you to go onto the Vob and have a closer look at some of these works because I think that's another challenge of working in the digital space is all of these artists put, um, put so much um, effort and care in decision-making in terms of how the different materials and colors and textures um, behave and how they how they look and feel so without with the resolution being slightly lower it feels a little bit unfair to, to to only see them like this but i'm really glad to be able to give a little bit more insight into the various practices and a little bit more understanding of where we came from from putting all these different people together Thank you so much, Akari. It's such a wonderfully insightful tour. I, I thought I knew these artists pretty well, but clearly there's so much depth to each of their practices and artworks. Um, it was such a treat, so thank you. Um, we've had lots of questions come through from the audience, so we'll try to get through as many as we can um, before the end of the hour. Um, but I wanted to start on this one because I myself am curious about it. Um, our audience member says, thank you so much. Such a beautiful exhibition. Was it difficult to set limits for yourself when producing a virtual exhibition in a fully constructed environment? When the sky is no longer the limit, it strikes me as difficult to know when to start and when to stop. That's a very good question. And I would say, even though we were unlimited in terms of the usual limits of space or how many people are gonna go through the space or all those kind of concerns, we were still limited by time and human labor because everything you see here had to be scanned and programmed. And there were so many iterations of like getting the scale right and the lighting right and the frames and the apertures of the windows. And the, so like, even though if we had had, you know, if we had had unlimited time and 50 programmers, this exhibition could have gone on and on. We could have done so many crazier things, but we did have that, sadly, we all have that limit. Um, whether we're existing digitally or physically, doing any kind of work digitally or physically, we only have a certain amount of time that can, time resource that can go into it. Um, but I really wanted to also give an opportunity to show, you know, each artist's work. Some artists and creatives like do different sorts of things. So like with Roberts Wood, for example, not just showing an image of the garment, but also showing their, her, that, that kind of animation of her, how she develops prints and then, 
you know, it, it was it was night and for Christina Walsh, like showing the different types of, of sculptural prosthetics she did. And it was really important to include that film. So some of, some of the artist practi practices also dictated what was what we needed to do to give justice to their work. But there are definitely lots of other things we could have done and we would have liked to include had we had unlimited time resource. Um. And then the next one is, it's so amazing to see how the artists have pushed the boundaries of 3D technology. Do you think, do you see the potential, how, sorry, how do you see the potential of technology affecting the way we experience art in the future? So I think that that's a really interesting question. And it's also, it's really, it's always really hard to say because, you know, things technology has a way of infiltrating our life and it, this change seems really subtle. I, I was talking the other day about, um, you know, if we think about things like that we use every day, like Uber or something, that, that actually that technology didn't exist, you know, whatever, 10, 10, 15 years ago, but now we just take it for granted. So I think um, the great thing I think about digital technology, and we felt that because of the pandemic and the last lockdown is that we didn't have access to see exhibitions and to look at artworks um and that but yet we still had access to consider things and think about things through through our screens and through through the di digital space so i think um and i think more and more artists are really interested as we spend you know as we as a human race spend more and more time on screens artists are more and more interested about discussing that in the content of their work and and delving into that so it's a it's an ongoing evolution um but I think that the Volve is really uh, revolutionary in this idea of like, you know, we always think of an exhibition in physical space and then there's a catalog, but maybe there's like another way that an exhibition can live on beyond just like a book. And maybe what a book can present is something very different than what something can present in this kind of, um, this mimicry of like an actual spatial um, exhibition where you can I mean, it's interesting because like what we're looking at now, you can see two different artists work, but if I was actually standing in the space, I'd probably see like more out of the corner of my eye. So that was something else that was kind of challenging and interesting is how to make the connections read um, when you're actually limited by like a kind of point of view frame. So, I mean, these are all different concerns that came up. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for speaking so lovely about the Vov and, and um, I think we also have explored this question internally a lot ourselves and I think that we find that with technology and digital experiences, they're never going to be, they're not aimed to try and replace the physical experience. Yes, during a pandemic, they're an amazing substitute whilst we couldn't physically go to see them, but what we're trying to explore is how can we harness the best that technology has to offer to expand the physical experience and offer different dimensions to it rather than to replace it or to kind of replicate it in a different way. Um, but I definitely think through Sarah Band's um, seven artists, they, they've all interpreted the technology so differently. It's amazing to see it all come together. Um, this next yeah, one. It's interesting too, because like it also brings in the question like, artists that are working in more digital like mediums, I think a traditional gallery experience struggles to find a way to express what they're doing because they're designing and creating in a, in a way that doesn't adhere to those rules of like an object on a plinth or, you know, like really with Ouroboros, it would be amazing to like walk through one of their landscapes and then have your, th your body 3D scan and put the garment on your 3D scanned avatar in this like fictional landscape and that would be like the real way to experience it but we kind of had to adapt it for this kind of you know a different way of pre presenting but I think it will be a big challenge for institutions going forward of how to present digital artworks and dig digital fashion. Absolutely I mean some of the institutions that we've worked with have created exact replicas of their physical space in the digital um, so it's interesting to see how you know, in one of the galleries of the physical um, institution, you couldn't have um, an augmented reality piece without someone wearing goggles. But now if they're looking through the laptop, you can have something floating in space where, as you said, gravity doesn't exist and all these different limits are no longer um, restricting. I think we've got time for one more question before we need to wrap up, um, which is about the digital architecture of the space. So 
The digital architecture almost looks skeletal itself, housing lots of intricate elements on the inside, just like a body would. Please could you explain your decision-making process when it came to the design of the digital architecture of the virtual gallery? Oh, thank you. I, that's such a nice um, thing to hear. But actually, um, so what the process of how it came about is that the vault had um, a few, like um, Natasha said, some of the museums just replicated their real space. Um, but then if you weren't replicating your real space, there were like a few kind of more or less um, starting points, like not templates, but there are templates that could be customized. So we toyed with so many different ways of presenting these works and like we went full circle and ended up coming back to like a kind of more traditional gallery space. But um, so then with like these walls that kind of divide one big room to kind of separate and make like a few different conversations within the exhibition. But the choice of doing apertures in the space was really to give a, an experience of Sian Fan's work. So again, like it would be really disorienting and difficult if within the exhibition, someone could just like walk off into this like infinite computer generated texture, but we still wanted you to be able to sense its infiniteness and the fact that it's like all enveloping and you get a sense that it's like existing above you and to the side and below you, even though you're inside this like kind of more traditional gallery space. Um, and then we just worked with kind of the proportions of, of the room and the fact that it was in thirds, putting the apertures at thirds that kind of also uh, connect with the walls that divide the space. Um, and then we, the Valve team mocked it up and we did some tweaks and adjustments and then what you've got is here. But that was actually a really, at the time it was like a bit like, oh no, I have to actually also design a space on top of curating the show. Like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. But then it actually became like one of a really enjoyable part of the process, which if you were curating a show in a museum or a gallery, you probably, I mean, you might be able to add a wall in or something, but you wouldn't be able to be like, yeah, okay, now let's blow a big hole in the ceiling and let's see what it looks like with like a round doorway. No, let's do a square doorway. So it was, it was actually a really fun part of the process in the end. Well, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I'm afraid that that's all we have time for today. So. Thank you again so much, Akari, and to Trino and May at the Saraband um, Foundation for bringing this virtual presentation to life. The VOV is an initiative co-founded by Outset Contemporary Art Fund and Art Science Collective Visiological. We'd also like to say a huge thank you to our technology partner, Vortic Art, for hosting season one of the VOV, and a heartfelt thank you to everyone here who's joined us this lunchtime in the audience. It goes without saying that the past year has been incredibly turbulent for the art sector, so your support and engagement means the world to us. The VOVS exhibitions, events and on-demand content is available to everyone for free in the hopes of raising as much money at this time for the art sector through donations. If you've enjoyed today, please consider donating even just a couple of pounds to help our cause by going to the website um, thevov.art through the link in the chat. The funds raised will be distributed equally between all the participating museums and galleries and organizations and however big or small your generosity is greatly appreciated. It's been such a pleasure to have you here with us today and I look forward to welcoming you back on the VOV again soon but until then thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you, thanks so much. <laughs>